Good morning. It's good to see everyone today. Welcome to church and uh, welcome in the name of Jesus today. Uh, it is good to see everyone. It's great to see such a, a large crowd. Uh, it's good to be back with you. We had a good time in, in Missouri last weekend um, at the 100th anniversary of, of Christine's home church. Uh, but it's good to be with you all, uh, our, our church family, and, and to be able to worship with you today. Uh, I've got several announcements today, so this, this might take a few extra uh, minutes. Um, you'll see that the Alabaster Church is still up out there. I left that up for another week in case there was anybody who did not bring their offering last week or forgot about it because uh, we hadn't had church in a while. So if you brought your Alabaster offering this week, uh, as you leave today, you can put that offering uh, in the church uh, that's just to the left of the doors as, as you're leaving. Um, to the right of the doors, we have another big display, as you saw coming in, uh, with a bunch of boxes. Those are our Operation Christmas Child boxes. Uh, we've done this for, uh, this will be our third year doing it now, um, uh, unless you guys did it years no okay so this is the third year we've done it now uh so and we have purchased the boxes for you so you do not have to find uh, a shoe box or get something from home um, we would like you to take those boxes home with you fill them and bring them back okay we have three sundays now to bring them back we they they need to be back by november 22nd uh, so, so please bring those back. We have a video that we're going to show you about the boxes, and then Julie Anderson's going to come and share some more information about them. Um, so is the video ready, Haven? This might take just a second. We're going to watch a video, and then Julie will come up. Peace and quiet. Peace and quiet. Now let's pack those Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes. If you're like me, it can be difficult to know where to start. To make things easier, just start with a box. Any average size cardboard or plastic box will work, but I find a shoe box works best. After that, you'll need to decide what age group you're going to pack for, and if it's for a boy or a girl. Now let's fill that shoe box. It's best to start by selecting a wow item. Something like a soccer ball and a pump or a stuffed animal. Something that's really special. Yes and yes. Once you've got your wow item, you can start to fill it with other fun stuff like toys, clothes, sandals, or even school supplies. <laughs> what do you mean, however? However, there are some items you don't want to include. Things like gum, toothpaste, items related to war, liquids. But for a complete list, check out the website. Oh boy, I think they're gonna like this. While a shoebox might seem small and simple, it can mean the world to a child who may have never received a gift. It shows God's love in a tangible way to children in need, and together with the local church worldwide, shares the good news of Jesus Christ. This is why you will also want to personalize your shoebox. Even including a letter or a photo of your family or yourself can make it extra special to the child. The most powerful thing you can do is pray. Pray that your gift will make an impact. That both the child and the community will discover the love and name of Jesus. <laughs> when your box is finished, you can make your $9 donation online or by mailing in your contribution using the business reply envelope in the brochure. This donation is critical for training and equipping local churches to share the gospel, along with the collection, processing, and shipping of the shoebox gifts. And don't forget to activate a label so you can follow your box and discover its final destination. Finally, make sure to check the website for the closest drop-off location near you. And make sure to mark the date for the third week in November as National Collection Week. Well, there you go. You just packed yourself a shoebox. <laughs> Grandma. Already done. What? How? I thought she wasn't going to stores right now. She isn't. She packed her box online. That's right, Dad. With just a few clicks of a mouse, 
Grandma packed her whole shoebox online. She can choose from all kinds of gifts, even make it personal by adding a letter and a photo. Wow, so she doesn't even need to leave the house. Nope, she can stay safe inside and still have time for Doomcraft. Talking complete. All right, thank you, Julie. Uh, for those watching at home, I apologize, but our camera is not working again. It's not changing uh, um, scenes. So this was the problem we were that Sean was having last week, um, and I thought I had it fixed this week. It was working earlier this week, uh, so I'm going to have to figure this out. But so you are stuck with this shot right here for those of you watching at home. And I apologize for that, but we'll get this, we'll get it worked out. Um, a few more announcements. Uh, quick trip script cards for the teams are due today. Uh, if you have your order forms, I'm sure Tara can take them to Sean. Um, you can give those to her before you leave today uh, or stick them in the box in the back. Um, Sunday night Bible study, we've been off of that for the last couple of weeks because I was gone for a week and and all that, but we're starting up a new study on Matthew. I'm really excited about this study. If you're not doing anything Sunday evenings and like to join us at six o'clock, I sent out the Zoom link uh, this week, and you're you're welcome to join us on Sunday evenings. 
I uh, also wanted to let you know about the prayer times we're going to be having both today and tomorrow. And these are prayer times specifically for our nation and for the election on Tuesday. Uh, it's just us humbling ourselves before the Lord um, in, on behalf of our nation. And so immediately following the service, uh, I'll wait about 10 minutes. Uh, but those who would like to stay after the service are welcome to stay and join us for prayer. And then also tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, also here at the church, 7 p.m., uh, we'll also be gathering for prayer. So if you'd like to stay either today or if, you, if you'd like to come tomorrow night or for both, uh, you're welcome to do that. And again, we're just giving you all the opportunity to gather uh, with us to, to pray for our nation uh, before our election. Um, I also, also want to say a few things about communion um, because I don't want to take the time to do this right before communion later on in the service. So I had bought the individually wrapped communion uh, wafer and juice like we've been using, and I bought it a couple, I, I realized I bought it a couple of months ago, um, but we haven't had service on the first Sunday, we, and we've been canceled, and so we just haven't had it. So I opened it up this week, and uh, it looks like the grapes of wrath happened in that box. <laughs> um, there, was, there was juice everywhere. Everything was sticky. A lot of the packages were open. And so I'm like, oh, what are we going to do? So, um, so we've gotten communion elements together. And I just want to explain to you now how we're going to do it at the end of the service when we do take communion. Um, so there's going to be two stations set up. Uh, Karen and Julie are going to take one set of elements to the back. There's a table in the, in the back room back there. Uh, and then there will be a station up here. Um, this side over here, you guys are going to head toward the back. And what, how we're going to do this, we're going to do this by family units. So one family unit at a time will go back, get their elements, and come back and sit down. And then the next family unit will go back, get their elements, come back and sit down. The juices are, are in cups, but they're spread out, so they're not like right next to each other. We would like you to take one of the juices uh, without, you know, touching all the other juices, of course. Um, take one of the, the juices, and then the person that is back there, the, or if, if it's me up here, we will, we will have gloves on, and we will take a wafer and place it into your hand, okay? That way there's not a lot of intertouching of things going on. This side over here, you're going to be up here with me. And again, we'll just do it by family units and, and all that. And those in the Outreach Center have a set of communion elements in the Outreach Center for them. Now, I also want to say, if, if there is still someone here today that is still uncomfortable with that setup, and they just you're still uncomfortable, I do not want you to feel judged if you do not take communion. If you decide that that is still unsafe for you, then no one's going to judge you for not taking communion, okay? So the end of the service, after my servant sermon, I'll invite you to, to receive the elements. And again, on this side, um, we'll start from the front to the back. So on this side, if, again, one family unit at a time, uh, this side will go back that way. This side will come up to me and, uh, and then sit down, then the next family unit will come up, okay? Everybody understand that? We good? All right. Great. Um, all right, I think that's all the, the announcements that I had for you today. So let us start then with our call to worship. And I'm going to invite you to stand out of respect for the reading of the Word. The call to worship today, for those of you who are at home, again, it won't be on the screen for you guys, but uh, Psalm 43 will be our call to worship. And as we've gathered in the name of Jesus and in the presence of Christ, let us hear from him today. Hear the word of the Lord. Vindicate me, my God, and plead my cause against an unfaithful nation. Rescue me from those who are deceitful and wicked. You are God, my stronghold. Why have you rejected me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? Send me your light and your faithful care. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain, to the place where you dwell. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my joy and my delight. I will praise you with the lyre, O God, my God. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? 
Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day and the opportunity to gather uh, in this place. And it's really, it's not the place that's important. What's important is your presence. And we have gathered in your presence today and in your name to worship you, to fellowship with one another, to fellowship with you. And Lord, we, we want nothing more than to be filled with the Holy Spirit this morning, to be able to encounter you in a new way, to have our hearts transformed and our minds renewed. So God, we give you this time. We offer it as an offering, as a sacrifice. And we just ask that and, and welcome you into this time and into this place together. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, Christine's going to come and we're going to worship through song today. All right, since some of you won't be able to um, see the screen, the first one, these are all from the hymnal. So if you have a hymnal at home, you can turn to page 88. We're going to sing Such Love. That God should love a sinner such as I should yearn to change. Just to the lowest hell. 
kingdoms fall. Women who here refuse to pray on rocks and hills and mountains grow. God's love so sure shall still endure all measureless and strong. Redeeming grace to Adam's race, the saints and angels. Page 460. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Amen. Amen. As we go to prayer this morning, you know, I mentioned that the prayer time after the service and tomorrow night is uh, for our nation and for the election. And uh, over the last 
several weeks, especially, I've, I've seen this quote from John Wesley come up uh, quite a bit. And, and I had never, I had actually honestly never seen it before, but um, it's a quote from John Wesley from 1774. And I do have it up there, Levi, if you want to go to the next slide. And it says this, this is from 1774. He says, I met with those of our society who had votes in the ensuing election and advised them, one, to vote without fee or reward for the person they judged most worthy, two, to speak no evil of the person they voted against, and three, to take care their spirits were not sharpened against those that voted on the other side. I think it's great advice from John Wesley, and that was back in 1774, and it's just as good advice uh, as it is today. I mean, we have the opportunity and the privilege to vote, and we should do that. But let us make sure that we don't speak evil of the person that we're voting against. And let's make sure that our spirits, that we take care of our spirits, that they're not sharpened against those who might choose to vote on the other side. Amen. So we pray, not just right now, but after the service on Monday, we pray not just for the election, but we're also praying for our hearts as well, that God would keep us from having our hearts sharpened against anyone else. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, once again, I just want to thank you for this day. Thank you for the hymns that we just sung, the truth of those hymns, the, the prayer of those hymns. Lord, we just pray that you would be our vision, that you would be the vision for our church, that you would be the vision for our families that you would be the vision for each of us individually and our own lives. God, I pray that you would be uh, our vision when it comes to the act of voting this week. God, I pray that you would give us wisdom. Help, help each of us and, and all those around our country who will vote on Tuesday. God, give us wisdom and, and help us to know Lord, who we ought to vote for. But God, just as importantly, as John Wesley advised, I pray that you would keep our spirits and keep our hearts from being sharpened. That we would not fall prey to, to the usual tension and hatred and slander that is thrown on either side, but that we would show love even if somebody votes uh, an opposite way than we vote, even if uh, somebody gets into office that, that we didn't vote for, God, I pray that, that we would continue to trust in you and that we would continue to show love to all those that we come into contact, no matter how they voted. Lord, I just pray that we as your church would not act like the rest of the nation, but that we would act in, in love, in kindness, in boldness, and in a trust and a belief on who, about who is on the throne. And we thank you, Lord, that you are on the throne. We acknowledge that today. And we just ask, Lord, that you would be with us this week. And we do pray for our nation, God. There is reason to be concerned. And, and, and... But, Lord... We trust you. And we ask that you would just go with us every step of the way this week. Lord, we lift up those who, who might be going through some difficulties in their life. Those with physical illnesses. Those with financial difficulties. Those who are struggling in their relationships. God, we ask your healing and your encouragement to be upon them. We ask that they would trust in you and that they would find you faithful no matter what they face. God, again, we thank you for your presence with us today. We thank you for the many ways that you bless our lives, that you give us guidance and wisdom, that you disciple us. The many ways that, 
that you are our peace and joy. God, we just give you the remainder of the service and we continue to look to you and and ask for your will to be done in our lives today. We pray all this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right, kids, I have a question for you. Okay? Is it up there? Yeah. What makes not just a good superhero, a really good superhero? What makes a good superhero? Kids, do you have any ideas? Constant? What makes a good superhero? Your favorite superheroes, what makes them super? What's, what is it about them that makes them a superhero? Any ideas? Strong? Super strength? Brave? Thinking of others? What's that? Confident? Likes defeating evil? All the adults are giving me the right answers. Come on. I, I was looking for something different that I could go into uh, my, my lesson here. So, you know, when we think of superheroes, we think of maybe they've got some radiation or which gave them superpowers or they have superhuman strength uh, or they have uh, really cool high-tech armor that, that gives them some, some cool abilities, right? Um, that, those are the kind of answers I was looking for from the kids. Um, in other words, that we look, on, we look on outward appearance, right? Well, in 1 Samuel... Uh, chapter 16, um, you probably have heard, kids, of, of King Saul. The, king Saul was the very first king of Israel, uh, but he disobeyed God, and so God had rejected him, and he wanted a new king to take King Saul's place. And so he got with his prophet Samuel, and he said, hey, I want you to anoint uh, another king, and that king was eventually going to be David. But God led Samuel to the house of Jesse. And this is David's dad. And, and, and Jesse brought out all his sons other than David first, all his, his firstborn son, his eldest son. And, and it says that um, when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab. Now, Eliab was Jesse's firstborn son. And Samuel thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Kids, what do you think God means when he says the Lord looks at the heart? Any thoughts? What's that? Don't care about their appearance. That's right. Right? Even, even if we're not talking about superheroes or we're talking about kings or, or presidents or we're talking about leaders, I mean, we tend as, as humans, we tend to look at the outward appearance. We like the outward appearance. We like when someone comes across as strong and in control and, and they're well off with their words and, and they're intelligent and, and they're, you know... But God says that he looks at the heart. And so whatever, whatever you do, and now let me back up for a minute. What I'd like to say, especially to you kids, you might look at your friends, you might look at other people and think, man, they run faster than me, they're bigger than me, they're faster than me, uh, they're just maybe a better person than I am. But you know what? If the Lord looks at the heart, then I think we ought to look at the heart too. And if the Lord looks at the heart, then we should not be about our outward appearance, whatever we look like or someone else looks like, we should look at the heart, okay? And I'm going to talk about the heart today in my sermon. So let me transfer then to, to talk to the adults. 
Although kids, if you want to listen, you can listen too. Since they so stole your kid's lesson, you can steal the adult lesson today, okay? All right. Um, so we are going to be... Sorry, I have lost... Where am I? Oh, I took my notes out and I lost my place. Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 3. I am going to be in Proverbs 2, but I'm going to, I'm going to get to Ephesians eventually. Um, so I'm going to start with reading Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. It's a well-known passage uh, to many of us. And I'm going to invite you to stand out of respect for the reading of the word today. Ephesians chapter 3, beginning with verse 14. Hear the word of the Lord. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Heavenly Father, again we come before you and give you thanks. And this time we give you thanks for your word. Scripture tells us that your word is living and active. That it divides uh, bones and marrow and soul and spirit that it judges the thoughts and intentions of our hearts. And so, God, we put ourselves under the scrutiny of the Word today, trusting, God, that you will speak to us how you want to speak to us and what we need to hear. So, God, may your Holy Spirit give us understanding and help us to apply it to our lives today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So over the course of the last several weeks, I have seen a, a phrase crop up in different articles I've read or, or, or things that I've listened to, uh, and that, that two-word phrase is COVID fatigue. You, you've probably heard it as well. And it's basically just to indicate the, the experience that many of us are experiencing. We're just tired of this whole thing. We're, we're tired of the masks. We're, we're tired of the quarantining. We're, we're tired of the testing. We're, we're tired of the, the fights about masks. The, just, just the whole experience, people are fatigued and tired about it. And it reminded me, uh, especially this week, um, the effect that this virus has had on us more than just the physical aspect. To be sure, people are getting sick. And there are some people that are dying over COVID. But we're also being aff affected uh, on the inside as well. There are many people who have died in nursing homes that they have written off to COVID-related. Even though they never might have had COVID to begin with, they, they label it COVID-related uh, because they can't see their friends, their family anymore. They, they can't get the visits like they used to. And they, they pass away. The suicide rates ha ha have grown. I mean, this pandemic has had an effect on us more than just in a physical way, but also in an emotional and, and inner way. Hence the phrase, COVID fatigue. But this should also remind us something, <clears throat> that there is an inner reality. Just like in the Samuel story, in the lesson we learned in the kids' lesson, that, that we tend to look at outward appearances, a lot of times we tend to focus on our outward lives, right? The, the, the life that we can experience through our five senses, the, our circumstances, 
everything that takes place, our actions and, and reactions, everything that happens in the outer world. But sometimes I think we forget that there is an inner world, an inner reality in each one of us. Now, the, the ancient Hebrews had a word for this. The Bible has a word for this. And that word is heart. Nine times out of ten, when you read the word heart in Scripture, they're actually not talking about the physical heart that is pumping blood through our veins and giving our body life. They're talking about, they're referencing this, this inner reality, this, this inner world that is within us. In biblical understanding, the word heart uh, is that, in some ways, it is our true self. Go on to the next slide, Levi. It, it's our true self. Oh, sorry, I'm not quite there yet. Did I mess up the slides? I might have messed up the slides. This slide says our heart. It's our true self. It's our inner self. It, in, in biblical understanding, it would include our, our intellect, the way we think, how we process information, how we act and react, and, and the different attitudes that we have. It would include our emotions, uh, the emotions of, of happiness, and, but also of sadness, of anger and, and love, and, and those emotions that we experience. It would also include our will, right? The things that we purpose, what motivates us. And, and all of this is wrapped up in this one word, heart. It is our inner life, the life that we cannot see with, with our eyes or hear with our ears, but we know it's reality because we feel and we think. It, it, it's what makes us who we are. And in Proverbs chapter 4, now you can go to that slide, Levi. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, the teacher says this, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Some translations will say it is, the, it is the wellspring of life. I really like how the New Living Translation translates it because it says, above all else, guard your heart, for it determines your life. The Hebrew word that is used here for, for flows actually means both the source of something and also the extent of something. And so our hearts are not just the source of, of our life, but is also the extent of our life, that we will never experience life more fully than what our hearts can contain. So if our hearts are healthy and vibrant and living, and again, I'm not talking about our physical hearts. If our hearts are healthy, if our emotions and thinking, if we're thinking the right things and feeling the right things and, and we're motivated by the will of God, if our hearts are healthy, then our experience of life will be full. But if our hearts are empty, if they're shriveled, if they're devoid of God and devoid of life, then, then there's not much life we're going to experience beyond that. You know, we've, I, I've heard stories uh, all throughout my times of ministry of, of individuals who on the outside seem to have everything. They've striven for and, and they have achieved wealth and power and prestige and, and they have the cars and the houses and, and everything that you would think that humans would want on this earth. But they would tell you that they're unhappy. They would tell you that there's still something missing. They have not tended or guarded the heart, and therefore their experience of life is limited. On the flip side, I've also heard stories of people who on the outside, you might think, man, they're suffering. They, they scrape to get by financially. Maybe they're dealing with some major health issues. And yet when you sit down and talk with them, there is a contentment that they express. There is a peace and a joy that even the one, if you're talking to them, it's like, man, I haven't even gotten to that. And I have more than they do. These are the people that we might label as saints, men and women of God. They may not have much on the outside, but, but their lives are full because their heart is healthy. The teacher says, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. And this is what it teaches us. The condition of our heart influences the condition of our life. 
The condition of our heart influences the condition of our life. If our heart is healthy, even if we run into difficult circumstances, we can still experience joy and peace and gladness and contentment in our lives. And so what does Paul have to say about this? Now going to the Ephesians passage that we started with. In Ephesians chapter 3, uh, the passage that I read, he starts out, for this reason I kneel before the Father. And, and we need to understand, in order to understand his prayer, we need to understand that reason that he mentioned. For this reason I kneel before the Father. So we need to understand what Paul's been talking about. Now over the course of the previous two chapters, Paul has talked about the grace of God that gives life to those who are dead in their sin. He's talked about the peace of God that has brought Jew and Gentile both together under one spiritual household. He's talked about the grace of God to him personally, that God has used him for his purposes and the purposes of the gospel. But at the very end, right before verse 14, verse 13 says this, Paul says, I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. Paul understood something. He understood this idea of this inner life. He understood the reality of the heart. And he understood the human temptation to look at outward appearances. And he knew that the Ephesian church looked at his sufferings and the persecutions that he was facing, the fact that he was in prison, the fact that, that he was struggling in his ministry so much, at least on the outside, and because of that, they might be tempted to discouragement. And so for this reason, he kneels before the Father and prays. Now, even the act of kneeling before the Father is very important to Paul. For a Jew, prayers were typically prayed standing. Kneeling indicated a certain earnestness about your prayer. Paul's not just praying, he is earnestly praying here for their hearts. Because he goes on, he, he prays in his prayer, he says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit, where? In your inner being. So that Christ may dwell, again, where? In your hearts, through faith. Paul's not necessarily just trying to spiritualize things. I think he's trying to get at a very important reality. He wants God to guard the hearts of the Ephesian believers. He could have easily prayed, God, help me to get out of prison. Save me from the persecution. That way, this will be an encouragement to the Ephesian believers. He, he could have prayed for the Ephesians' outward circumstances and said, you know the suffering that they're doing. Could you help them out? But he prays instead for their hearts. He prays that God would strengthen not their outer life, although that does happen when the heart is strengthened, but he prays that God would strengthen them with power through His Holy Spirit in their hearts. So the first thing that Paul reminds us is that our hearts need to be taken care of. You know, if I'm driving down the street, and my car all of a sudden begins to shudder or shake or there's a knocking noise in the engine, right? It doesn't matter what's on my schedule this week. It, it doesn't matter, you know, if, I've, if I'm a very busy person, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take the time as soon as I can to get that vehicle into the mechanic. If I all of a sudden get a pain in my arm or my back goes out or, or I start having massive headaches and I'm, I'm not used to having headaches, again, it doesn't matter what I have planned this week or how busy I am, I'm going to take the time to make an appointment and go see the doctor to have my body checked out. So why is it, I wonder, and I wonder this with myself too, why is it that whenever I struggle with my heart, 
whenever I'm struggling maybe with, with sadness or some emotion or, or even COVID fatigue or, or I'm, I'm tempted uh, to, to sin in a certain way, why is it that I always tell God, well, I'm just too busy? I'm just too busy to get into your word. I'm too busy to spend time in prayer with you. I'm too busy to, to go to the great physician that not only heals my outward body, but also heals my emotions and renews my mind and empowers my heart. Our hearts need to be taken care of, especially in this time that we're experiencing, especially with the pandemic, especially with the elections, like, we, like I referred to when, when um, quoting John Wesley. It, it's not just about the outward appearance of, of who gets elected. It, what also matters is our hearts in the whole process. What also matters is the hearts of the candidates in the whole process. What also matters is the heart of the nation in this whole process. Our hearts need to be guarded. They need to be fed. They need to be tended. They need to be taken care of. And that starts with us taking the time to care for our hearts just as much as we take the time to care for our outward circumstances. The second thing that Paul reminds us in, in, in this passage is that our hearts need the strong foundation of God's love. Paul says, he's, you know, he prays that, that God may strengthen them with power, that Christ may dwell in their hearts through faith. And he says, and I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. First of all, I'd like to say that our hearts, every heart, needs a foundation, needs something to base and build their lives upon. And it's not always the love of God, but we all need, it's very important that our hearts have a foundation. He, he uses the word rooted here. And that makes me think of a flower. We, you might be amazed if you walk outside. There might be a beautiful flower that you see, and you're amazed by the beauty of that flower. But you know what is crucial to the beauty of that flower? Strong roots. If that flower has weak roots or if the roots are shriveled up, that's not going to be a very beautiful flower. In the same way, it's the same with our lives. You see somebody who, who might be beautiful, not in the physical sense, but just their spirit. There's a spirit about them, and, and you appreciate them, and it's usually because they have some pretty strong roots. They have a foundation in their heart. And it is that foundation, that root in our heart, that allows us to experience beauty and exude beauty in our lives. But Paul is very specific here. He doesn't just want them to be rooted or established in, in anything. He wants them to be rooted and established in love, particularly in God's love, in this love that surpasses what, what we can really fathom in our own minds. Uh, this love that, that is wide and long and high and deep. This love that would, be, that would enable to fill them to the measure of all the fullness of God. If we are able to grasp and experience the love of God, we have a strong foundation in our hearts. I might face some very difficult circumstances. I might face financial trouble. I might face relationship trouble. I might face work problems. I might face COVID. I might face tension. I might face all sorts of things. But in my heart, if I have a firm grasp that God loves me, that He died for me, that He wants nothing more than to strengthen my inner life, and if I have a relationship 
with God and experience that love on a daily basis, then there is a sense of contentment and joy and peace that we can experience despite our outward circumstances. Someone who does not have the love of God as their foundation, someone who does not grasp that, someone who has not experienced it, no matter if they thrive in this life in an outward sense, they will struggle in life. They will always feel empty. They will always feel wanting and a lack of fulfillment in their life. Our hearts need a strong foundation, but what they really need is the strong foundation of God's love. The third thing, and and I don't want to take too much time on this, but it's important too. Our hearts need other hearts. I love how Paul puts it in his prayer. He says that he prays that they may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how high and deep and, and so on is the love of Christ. Our hearts need other hearts. Can we understand God's love just on our own? Yes, we can. And yes, we can relate to God on our own, but God created us to be in relationship. God created us in such a way that we experience God's love, not just when He just shows us His love, but a lot of times He shows us His love through other people. We experience God's love as we live together in community, as we love one another, as we take care of one another, as we rejoice with those who rejoice or mourn with those who mourn. The more our hearts connect with one another and we show love to one another, the more and more fully we can experience the love of God in our lives. And so our hearts need other hearts. And the last thing Paul reminds us is that the love of God leads to a full life. And I've kind of already mentioned this actually. But he says... Verse 19, to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. You know, no matter how much, many times I read that, and I've been in ministry now for, for you know, 16 years, what does that even mean? To be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. I read that, and I can't help but think, that I haven't arrived there yet. Because <laughs> to me, being filled to the measure of all the fullness of God would be incredible. It, it would be awesome. It, it, it would be just having this firm understanding of the love of God and, and being drowning in His love in a way. What, what would that even look like? to be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God, that, that all of God is filling us to the capacity. And if, if our hearts, as we talked about from Proverbs, if our hearts are not just the source of our life, but also the extent of our life, man, I want to be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. That way, my life will be that much more full. I want to be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God so that I could experience fullness of life again, despite my circumstances. In John chapter 7, we see Jesus in Jerusalem during a festival. And it says this, verses 37 and through 38. It says, On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. He goes on to talk about that what he means by that is the Spirit. Or John mentions that, that what he means by that is the Spirit of God. But Jesus doesn't pray, anybody who believes in me, I'm going to bless you physically. I'm going to bless you with, with riches. I'm going to bless you with, with power and influence. He says, whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them.
So have we guarded our hearts? Have we tended to our hearts recently? Have we taken the time to feed our hearts the right thing? We had a great conversation, or what I stayed for, because I had to leave early, in Sunday school this morning. And we're going through the Ten Commandments and, and talking about how Jesus kind of, in some ways, reinterpreted or reimagined the Ten Commandments in His Gospels. And we talked a lot about our hearts and the condition of our hearts. And elsewhere, both Matthew and Mark, and I think Kim Manier mentioned this in, in her Sunday school lesson, it talks about how out of the condition of our hearts, our, our mouth speaks. All the evil that we actually do in our outward life, it starts from within. So if inside of us is hurting and broken and not right, then our outward life is not going to be right either. Our hearts need to be taken care of so that we don't have to suffer from COVID fatigue. Am I sick of masks? Yes. And am I sick of the whole thing? Yes. But do we have to face COVID fatigue? Do we have to, to be influenced in our inner life? I don't think we would be if we were filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Our hearts need to be taken care of. My friends, it is vital that we have the strong foundation of God's love in our lives. We need other hearts. Even if we can't gather as much as we would like to, find some way, a phone call, a Zoom call, something in which you can have a conversation with another fellow believer, with another Christian, and you can share life together. Because know this, it is not, well, let me ask this, what, what would be life to you? What would be a good life to you? It's not riches. It's not having health, physical health. Life is not about what happens on our outside. Life begins on the inside. Life begins with our hearts. And the love of God in our hearts, filling our hearts, will give us fullness of life as well, both on the inside and on the outside. So I'd like to invite you to join me this week in taking care of your heart in some way. Spend some time in Scripture. Spend some time in prayer. Again, I'm not trying to just spiritualize reality, but we have to be aware that there is an inner reality in our lives, that our lives are not just comprised of what happens to us in our circumstances, but our life is also comprised of what happens on the inside. Be mindful of that this week. In all that you do, whether you're at work or home or in anything you put your hands or minds to, be mindful of that. God, I believe, wants nothing more than to renew our minds and to heal our hurts, our past hurts, to heal our emotions, to transform our will, that we might understand and grasp how high and wide and long and deep is the love of Christ, that we too might be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. And I thank you for this lesson. I thank you, God, for your love for us. The love that you expressed on the cross. The love that you express every day through your presence in our lives. And God, we, we, we admit that we have gone through a difficult year this year. And it doesn't seem to be ending anytime soon. But God, I pray that you would guard our, guard our hearts. I pray that as we commune with you in prayer, as we read your word, as we fellowship with other believers, that God, that you would use 
that, to fill us with your Holy Spirit, to make our hearts healthy, to make our hearts strong, that no matter what our circumstances turn out to be, we would still experience life in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, if there is someone here today or, or watching this online, if there is someone who has not put their trust or hope in you, who has never taken that step, and Lord, your Holy Spirit might be convicting them today, might be um, making them aware of the emptiness of their own heart. Lord, I pray that you would hear their prayer. God, I pray that your spirit would draw them to you, would draw them to confess their sins and ask for your forgiveness and invite you into their lives. I pray that your love and your spirit would, would draw them to, to begin to guard and tend their hearts, to become more aware of what's happening on the inside rather than just what's happening on the outside. Lord, respond to that prayer. Hear their prayer. Save their hearts. And God, I pray that you would lead them as they begin to tend their hearts moving forward. Lord, thank you for this reminder. And I just pray that you would remind us every day to spend some time of our day as our... As our um, day planners fill up and our schedules fill up with, with all the outward things that, that we have to get done, God, would you remind us to spend a little bit of time every day guarding our hearts, taking care of them, making sure that we grasp your love for us. Father, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So in just a few minutes, we're going to take communion together. So I'd like to start by reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And then we just need a couple, uh, a minute or two to, to get set up, and then I'll invite you to come forward. But use this time to pray. Use this time to kind of recognize what's going on in your own heart. As we come to the table this morning and, and partake of this very real expression of the love of God for us, use this time to analyze your own heart. Or better yet, have God analyze it. Pray what, what the psalmist said, Search me, O God, and know my heart. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Take the time to take care of your heart this morning as we come to the table. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul says this, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. In just a few moments, I will invite you to come. But just take this time to pray silently. <clears throat> 